today I'm going to cover two things. I'm covering uh, busy beavers. Uh, and uh, what's called Kolmogorov complexity. This is just sort of a fun little uh, study. We're going to talk about a maximization problem and a minimization problem. So. So what are busy beavers? So a busy beaver is a set of numbers. It's a function such that BB of N is uh, the program. We're looking essentially for programs which halt and produce the most output possible. What programs print the most and halt? So I can always trivially make a program to print infinitely, right? Print one on the tape, move uh, right, print one on the tape, move right, repeat that forever. So we were concerned with programs which print a lot and halt. So let b b of n be the maximum number of ones a Turing machine on n states prints and halts. So you take every Turing machine of n states, one of them is going to print the most number of ones on the tape and halt. And you take that one and you say the number of ones that one printed, that one is uh, BB of n. Okay. So this number, these haven't really actually been computed because you have to simulate so many Turing machines, it can take a while. Off the top of my head, I think like BB, we're still simulating BB of 5 for several years. I could be wrong about this. I think this is greater than like 4,000. We're still checking some edge cases and we have been for how long because some of the simulations are still running. And I think BB of six, BB of six is not even started to be computing, but there are some lower bound results that, that say that this is going to be like 10 to the 10,000 or something, right? And I think for BB of four, unless we've uh, computed it for, but we haven't, actually computed the values for these they exist obviously uh but we don't know what they are so this is sort of like you could think of it literally like a beaver so like what does a beaver look like so what does a beaver do it spends a lot of time chewing Yeah, that's pretty good, actually. So you could picture the Turing machine. Some of the obvious ones, if you're trying to come up with the Turing machine to print the most number of ones, they're just going to print one, and they're going to move, and they're going to print one, and they're going to move, and they're going to print one, and they're going to move, and they're going to print one. But some of the solutions are actually like they print one, they jump over here, they print one, they go back, they erase one, they come here, they write one, they erase something, they come back, and they write one. And they look kind of like animals. They're like moving all over the place, and they're chewing on things, and they're like... They're really busy, right? So that's what the name Busy Beaver comes from. This is sort of a maximal printing Turing machine of some size. It turns out, though, that uh, Busy Beavers is uncomputable. It's not a computable function. Another way to write this is that uh, BB of n, such that n is a binary string of this computable function, uh, is not decidable. So the idea is if a Turing machine prints the maximum number of ones for any other Turing machine its size and it halts, that's the most important step, if it does anything more than that, then it must loop forever. Consider, I'll, I'll, here's the proof. Consider 
the universal uh, Turing machine with a second tape. So on uh, simulation, so universal, recall universal Turing machine takes on input a machine and possibly a word and it simulates the machine until it halts or perhaps it doesn't halt. Uh, so we, so with a second tape on simulation of a machine M, uh, for each step of M, write a one on the second tape. Uh, let H of N, which is like H is here is for halting, be the max number of steps of a TM of size N. So with N states. If you simulate a machine of N states past this, it must loop forever. And if you simulate a machine for less than it and it halts, uh, then it uh, it halts. So if H of N was computable, then you could decide halting. So that's sort of the trick we're going to use here. So uh, this is first just the definition. Then obviously if we simulate the machine on M, what we get is that there exists some K only dependent on n and u so these by the way are are, are given or fixed uh, such that the number of maximum halting steps on n is less than or equal to bb of n plus sub k try and convince yourself that this is true that's sort of the crux of the proof actually Uh, so since k is only dependent on n and u, uh, this implies that k is computable. It depends exactly on the construction of u, but it's fine. So here's our de decider for halt. Assume to the contrary a bb of n was decidable. I'll say computable. Let's decide halt. So on input M, just omitting the word here, doesn't particularly matter. We're going to compute uh, N equals the size of Q from the encoding of M. So basically we take the table of m of the number of states and we just call that n we save that as a variable uh, then we're going to compute k from uh, u and n then by assumption bb of n is computable we're going to compute uh, bb of n uh, plus k now we're going to simulate M given by this encoding for B, B of N plus K uh, plus one steps. If M halts before this, then it halted. So we can just say accept. If M has not halted at this point, uh, else reject. So that means M will not halt. It, because if M takes more than BB of N of K steps, then N has taken more than H of N steps. So clearly uh, N is gonna, uh, M is going to be in a loop. So this is a decider for halt. BB of N computable. 
This will imply that halt is decidable. A contradiction. So BB of n is actually not decidable. It seems kind of crazy that this the, these numbers are not computable because you would think that you could just sort of brute force search them, right? You enumerate all the Turing machines, and then you run them, and then when the, when they halt, uh, you count the ones. The problem with that is, though, you have to know if they halt or not. So you could recognize the set, uh, but you couldn't decide it. Otherwise, you could decide uh, halting, as described here. This is sort of a cute maximization problem with uh, Turing machines. That it's sort of these numbers are so huge; they're sort of like atmospheric. You know, we're not talking about any Turing machine that might not even get close to these numbers. You know, if you run for this much time. And then you say you run for twice that much time, you're not going to get give the Turing machine more power. It's just a, it's a, it's a really interesting thing. So this was the maximization problem. We're considering the maximum number of ones a Turing machine could write. Okay, now on to Kolmogorov complexity. So fun fact about Kolmogorov, he worked in like a million different fields related to probability theory and information theory, and this is kind of about information theory. And there was this, uh, he was like secretly gay, and he lived in a one-bedroom cottage with this other famous mathematician named Alexandrov, and then they were like blackmailed to report their academic advisor to like Stalin or something. I think it was called the Luzin Affair. It's really interesting, uh, crazy stuff. Anyway... Um, so what is the Kolmogorov complexity? So Kolmogorov complexity is about st is about strings. It's a measure of like the amount of information that a string contains. So we define k of x such that you know x is a string. Uh, so first of all, k takes on k takes on a string and outputs a number. So it's like k of x is equal to the length. So I could write this as the length of the encoding of m of the smallest Turing machine to print x right here, x and halt. Why is this a good measure of information or a good measure of randomness? Well, consider what kind of Turing machines would have to print the following strings. Consider 1 to the m plus n plus 1, or the string 1 to the m, 0, 1 to the n. So this string is all 1s. This string is all 1s, but then there's a 0, and then it's all 1s. So if you were to describe this string to someone... Here you could just say m plus n plus 1, print this, you could just tell them, print 1 m plus n plus 1 times. Here, you would have to specify the 0. So you could do this several ways. You could specify m, then 0, and then n. You could specify m plus n plus 1, and then say the look, then add a location of a 0 uh, at here at this exact location, or something like this, right? So the complexity of this string containing a single digit difference it's going to be greater uh, than the complexity of this one. So first thing you might think, well, what about we can just hard code the string, right? And of course, actually, you can. So uh, let uh, C be a uh, constant only dependent on the encoding of Turing machines. So if we have a programming language instead of Turing machines, for example, C would be, I would at least have to have like the sentence uh, print, uh, I'll say this way, the length of the string print open close is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So uh, that would imply that like C is greater than or equal to 7 for Python, right? But it's dependent only on the language. It's not dependent on the input at all. You can think of it like the plus C from calculus. So then it's true that K of X is less than or equal 
to the size of x plus c. Uh, proof, let, let p of x be the Turing machine to print x hard-coded and halt. This Turing machine prints x and halts because x is hard-coded into this Turing machine. The size of p of x is going to be around the size of x plus some constant baggage, right? So p of x, the size of p of x is around the size of x plus constants. So this is one machine that prints it. So clearly k of x is less than or equal to this, right? So clearly k of x is less than or equal to this, but there could be a smaller one. So it's less than or equal to, not equal to. but some strings are compressible and incompressible. So consider um, k of xx. I could say uh, this one, I could say 2x plus c, but it's actually true that this is less than or equal to the size of x plus c. And if you apply the first result, this is uh, greater than or equal to uh, 2 times x plus c. So what this is saying as a result, first of all, is that doubling the string does not really double the amount of information in the string. That's kind of important. You may already be seeing the idea here. What we're going to do is take the Turing machine, which prints x, and we're going to, instead of copying it twice, we're going to call it twice. So here's the bad idea. Uh, we're going to take a p of x, this prints x, we're going to wire it with some constant baggage, we're going to print another p of x, and this is going to print, uh, so this will print xx of size uh, like 2x uh, plus c, and then c again is the constant. But what we could do is something like this, here's a better idea, good idea. It's a little more work, but it would result in a smaller machine. So we have some machine P of X. What we're going to do is keep track of a bit and run it through it twice. So uh, keep track of bit. After it prints, we're going to hand off control to this. We're going to pass it through here. Uh, I'll go ahead and say that this is the initialization. This is the initialization. And then after we're done here, we're going to halt. So what happens here is we're going to print P of X. We're, we have a bit set to be zero. If the bit is zero, we're going to set it to one and we're going to call P of X again. Then if the bit is one, we're going to halt. So this is going to be constant size. It keeps track of a bit. That's it. And it does handoff control to P of X. This uh, is a Turing machine to keep track of, uh, to, to print, this is a Turing machine to print P of X. So the size of this then, uh, so this prints XX of size. Well, we have P of X is around X. So, and we have two constants, a constant for P of X and a constant for this one. So this is, it's still a constant. So it's going to be, around the size of x plus c. So that's kind of uh, fascinating stuff, that the sort of measure of information in a string by doubling it doesn't really tell you anything. And that kind of makes sense. If someone reads a book to you twice, they're not really telling you any new information. So in that, that analogy makes sense here. You may also realize that if you have a sort of user interface understanding of file compression, of like zipping files, the information in XX is not going to be more than X. So you could think of XS as a compressible string. So XX is a, what we call a compressible uh, string. So we say uh, X is compressible if K 
k of x is less than the size of x. We say x is compressible if k of x is less than the size of x. So there's a shorter way to represent the string than the string itself. So consider, consider uh, perhaps the most compressible string, k to the 1 to the n. So n is just some number. The program is going to say, is going to keep a counter. So here's the, here's a, this is less than or equal to log n plus c. So this is actually very small. So in that sense, this is almost the most compressible string. So we're going to keep a counter. Um, of n using how many bits? We're going to keep log n bits. Uh, at each step, print a 1. So this is going to print n1s, and we need log n bits to keep track of n. We don't want n plus 1 or n minus 1 or anything. We need exactly n bits. So it's log n, and then c again here is the constant depending upon calling print and all these things. So do there exist any incompressible strings? Actually, yeah, most of them are. And we can count them. So I could give you a string and then try and argue, oh, look, this one, there's no way I could do this. But I think this is a better argument. Consider the set, the ratio of compressible strings to uh, all strings. So consider the, the ratio. The set on top is going to be x is a string such that uh, the size of x is equal to n. So we're, let's just consider strings of length n. The Kolmogorov complexity of n is less than uh, the size of x minus d. So what we're saying is that... Oh, I put an n here. What we're saying is that x can be compressed by uh, d bits. So d could be... We could consider you know strings compressible by one bit. Strings compressible by two bits. How small of a file can we get here? Uh, and on the bottom, let's just consider uh, all strings of length n. So this would give us a ratio for how many strings of length n are compressible by d bits. x is any string such that the length of x is equal to n. So, and we're asking the size of the set. So, what, by the, by the first theorem, uh, first result, the numerator we can bound from above by 2 to the n minus d, but then it could, this is only programs, I mean, this is all programs equal it. We could sum up of all programs less than it. So this is 2 to the n minus d plus 1. And then a denominator here, how many strings exist of size n? It's an easy question. This is going to be 2 to the n. So then this is equal to 1 over 2 to the d plus 1. It's like, wait, actually, wait a minute. This is the set of compressible strings. The set of compressible strings, compressible by d bits, gets half as much smaller every time you ask for another bit of compression. So, like, to apply this, I could say, uh, how many strings of length n are compressible By let's say five bits, which is nothing. We're asking for, we're asking to remove a well. Let's say eight, so we could say a byte, by one byte, which is eight bits. So we're asking to you to shave off one byte of the string, which for large n might seem you know, it's worthless. It's a it's a packet. It's it's nothing. Well, what we get then is we plug this into this. So we have, uh, one over two to the two to the nine, which is like. This is uh, 1 over 512. So almost 1 in 1,000 programs are going to be compressible by a byte. The rest are not. So most strings are actually incompressible. So how many strings are compressible by even one bit? Uh, not many. So most strings are incompressible. If you're given like a noise like a, like an image of TV static and you're asked to you know write it somehow shorter represented in a shorter way 
you're usually not going to do much better than the image itself. Something I've been sort of dancing around and haven't given a straight answer for is how you could compute X, uh, compute K. And it turns out you can't. K is uncomputable. So we had a maximization problem with Turing machines and showed that was uncomputable. This is a minimization problem with Turing machines and it's also uncomputable. Here's the, here's the contradiction. And this, just some history of this proof, there was proofs with classic reductions for this that were very messy and complicated. And then sometime later, after uh, all of this was fleshed out in literature, somebody came up with this very short, beautiful proof. And it's uh, quite clean. And what is it going to use? It's going to use a recursion theorem. Uh, let M be a Turing machine. Obtain by the recursion theorem a copy of M by recursion theorem. And I'm going to say set, we'll call it n equal to the size of m. For each x in sigma star, this is going to be lexicographically. So what that means is we're going to go alphabetically. So we're going to be like uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Right? We're going to go in that order. Right, so we're going to for loop over the, the strings lexicographically. Uh, check if k of x, so we're assuming again k of x here is computable, is greater than, is strictly greater than uh, n. And if that is the case, then we're going to print uh, x and halt. So what's what's the contradiction here? M prints uh, the smallest x such that k of x is strictly greater than or equal to the encoding of M. But M prints x. So Kolmogorov complexity of x is less than or equal to the size of m, which is a contradiction from the behavior of x, for the behavior of k of x here. So k of x is incorrect. So if k of x was computable, then m would also be uh, computable, and this is a contradiction. So this is kind of interesting. If you're thinking again back to these analogies I keep making about file compression and zip files, if you take the files that you're zipping as a string, you just concatenate the bits, and you compress it with some compression algorithm, zip, gzip, lz, whatever, there's no way of knowing if this compression is truly the smallest representation of that object. It's undecidable. The undecidable results for Kolmogorov complexity actually go even stronger. Uh, let r equal the set x sigma star uh, such that k of x is greater than equal to x. The set of incompressible strings. This is, these are all strings which cannot be compressed. R is undecidable. It'd be convenient if it was decidable because you could, again, looping back to file compression, you could just say, oh, these, these files in this order, it's uncompressible. So I'm just going to combine them into a folder. I'm not going to do any compression at all. So assume to the contrary, it is decidable. that let's say M decides R. So consider the following machine. Consider M prime, such that on input, it takes as input an integer N. It's going to loop through the strings of length N for each X in uh, sigma to the, not sigma star, sigma to the N, so it's lexicographically. Uh, if 
x is incompressible, we're going to print x and halt. So here m prints x uh, and halts. x is the lexicographically least compressible string. Uh, it's an incompressible string, which is uh, it's an incompressible string which is of length n and the smallest lexicographically. So since uh, m prime prints x, k of x is greater than or equal to n. But we can represent x in log n bits. Uh, so k of x is less than or equal to log of n plus c. Uh, so for big enough n, this is not true. For large... How can something be less than log n and greater than n? Some results that uh, Kolmogorov complexity have helped us with is uh, so. For example, on a on a on a on a one tape a DTM to decide the language of palindromes uh, takes everyone's first solution takes n squared to decide palindromes. You basically have the palindrome as a string, and then you loop back and forth between it, and the string machine should take O of n squared steps. And people were like, well, can't we do better than that on a one-tape DTM? If you change the model here, actually, you can do better. If you consider a RAM machine, you can do it in ON. Right? You access this one, you access this one, you access this one, you access this one. You don't have to do any looping. It takes you just It's the length of the string. But here, because you have to loop back and forth on a Turing machine, it takes n squared. Actually, you can't. And you can use something what's called the method of incompressibility. You can assume that there exist incompressible strings, and you can use that to solve certain problems. So there was a result in, I think, the 90s that showed actually this problem also takes a floor of n squared. So you combine those, you can't do much better, at, actually. You could do, there is a proof of things like Gödel's incompleteness uh, from Kolmogorov complexity. If there was a consistent and complete axiomatic system, then all strings would be compressible, which we know not to be true. Things like this. As a final problem, I can, as I can tell you something like, um, if you consider, uh, let's say, uh, C on input X outputs x dot sip so basically c is a compression algorithm the com complexity of k uh, zip is not going to be it's got to be greater than or equal to the complexity of x dot zip dot zip if uh, if c is good if c is good so this seems kind of counterintuitive. Obviously, if I'm compressing it, I should be able to make it smaller. But if C is a good compression algorithm, it's going to make this. It's going to produce an incompressible string. Otherwise, I can make a new algorithm which just runs C n times until we are, we're not getting a smaller file size. In fact, I think on a Mac, if you keep compressing files, they get bigger for some reason. I think everyone, when they're a kid, they tries they they realize that zip files are smaller, and then they're like, wow. I'm just going to zip this file a million times and then the movie is going to fit on my flash drive. Uh, and then like, that doesn't work. Otherwise, everything, if this was true, then you could compress a file uh, to a single bit every single time, right? And it wouldn't be lossless. Otherwise, So if this is true, why do we even use zip files? Why do we, even, if we have all these undecidable problems and things we can't do with zip files, why do we still use them? It's because in practice they work. Most strings uniformly randomly chosen are incompressible. Yes. But most strings that human 
deal with are not like this. Like a picture of a parrot is going to have big splotches of red and blue on it. It's not going to look like TV static. There's some structure in the files that humans use, you know. A uh, MP3 file is going to have, you know, a rhythm in it. It's going to have a repetition, you know, lyrics are going to be the same or, or so on. There's going to be structure that humans introduce into these things, which makes them not totally uniform and random.